the Simulcast Cafe. Great to have you joining us. Just a word of explanation about my voice. I suffered an injury to my voice 24 years ago. And uh, so they're making the sound system work for me today. And I'm just going to say it right straight out of the gate. He's the Lord, my healer. Amen. He's promised. And I'm holding to, I hold to his promise every day and wait on him to fulfill what he has promised. When the voice shut down, the writing opened up. And so now there's a bunch of books out there. And if the message this morning connects for you, you can get go deeper in this book between the lines. God is writing your story. I invite you to open your hands as we pray. Lord, thank you for the privilege of being gathered in the beautiful name of Jesus Christ. And now we ask for the ministry of the Holy Spirit to be strongly with us in the ministry of the Word. Lord, I'm asking that every person hearing this message whether in this building or via a webcast, Lord, that everyone would receive something from your heart. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, the writer is referring to chapter 11, in which we have some of our heroes mentioned, Moses, Abraham, David, and others, called a cloud of witnesses. I used to think that the cloud of witnesses was the heroes of yesterday, looking from the balconies of heaven and saying to us, we're watching you. <laughs> but now I realize they're not witnesses to our lives. They're witnesses to the grace of God. Their lives are a living story. I went through fire. I went through darkness. I went past hell. I couldn't see my way. The promises of God weren't working. Heaven was silent. But I held to his hand, I stayed in his word, I gave him my love, and now I declare at the end of my days, he is a good God, he is a faithful God, he finishes what he starts, he's good to his word, you can trust him, you can give him your heart. And I want my place in that cloud. I want a story to say to every generation. I couldn't see my way. It wasn't coming together. But I stayed in his love. I gave him my heart. And now I declare to every generation, he is a good and faithful God. May God give us our place in that cloud of witnesses. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In the actual Greek language, the word our is not present. Literally, the verse is the author and finisher of faith. Jesus is the author of faith. He designed it. He conceived it. It was his brainchild. He wrote its DNA. So if you want more faith, go to the man who made it. He's the source of faith. He will launch you into faith. He will strengthen your faith, and he will perfect your faith. He's the author and finisher of faith. I just want to brag for a little while this morning. I'm 
Jesus, the author. He's the author of our salvation. He's the author of faith. He's the author of world history. He's the author of your story. Let's talk about Jesus, the author. Revelation 1. Jesus comes to John in a powerful encounter. And the very first words out of Jesus' mouth is this, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Come down to verse 11, he says it a second time. Then when you come to the end of the book of Revelation, he's going to say it two times over again. Four times in the book of Revelation, Jesus says to John, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He's speaking to John in Greek. In the Greek language, Alpha is the first letter of the alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the alphabet. If he was speaking to John in Russian, he probably would have said, I am the ah and the ah. If he was speaking to John in English, he probably would have said, I am the A and the Z. If he was speaking to John in Chinese, I don't know what he would have said. <laughs> but he says, I am the first letter of your alphabet, and I am the last letter of your alphabet. And by implication, I'm every letter in between. In other words, as the Alpha and the Omega, he is the very stuff that comprises word because he is the living word. Furthermore, as the Alpha and Omega, he is the stringing together of those words into sentences, because he is the truth. Furthermore, as the Alpha and Omega, he is the arranging of those sentences into stories, because he is the author. So when Jesus comes to John as the Alpha and Omega, he's coming to him as the author. John, I'm visiting you as the author. And what a book he is about to write. The book of Revelation. But this is going to have implications for John's story as well. When Jesus visits John, he's roughly 90 years old. He's on a Roman rock, an island called Patmos. It was an island where they banished prisoners. No, you know, no, no, no restaurants, no lodging. They just dropped you off on the rock. I don't think he was enjoying his prison island. Besides, he's 90. Now, I'm 59, and I'm going to tell you what it's like when you get to be 59. Are you ready for this? I've got the funkiest things going on in my body. I got stuff happening here, happening here, happening here, happening here, happening here. There's times that my body's just going 59, 59. I can't imagine how my body's going to be talking to me if I ever get to 90. I'm telling you, John's body is talking to him. He's 90, and he's a prisoner. I put myself in John's shoes. I'd be ready to check out. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. It's time for another generation to take the baton. Beam me up, Jesus. And Jesus comes to John when he's 90 and basically goes, buckle up. I'm about to write a new chapter in your story. 
There's no indication up till this time that the Lord has ever used John in a prophetic ministry. And at 90, he's going to launch him into this entirely new vista of ministry. John, you're going to prophesy to nations. You're going to prophesy to generations. Not only am I giving you a new chapter in your story, I'm fixing to give you your best chapter. He did say fixin', by the way. <laughs> You're never too old for Jesus to write a story with your life, to write a new chapter with your life. The, now, just because we know that God's writing a story with our lives does not automatically mean we get every chapter. I think there are going to be in heaven believers love the Lord, born again, will have entire chapters missing from what God wanted to write. Why? Because it's not enough that Jesus Christ lays hold of you to write a story with your life. Philippians 3, you must lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of you. Something inside of us needs to become passionately vehement. Give me my story. I want every chapter you've got for me. I want the chapter that I'm in right now. And I especially want that last chapter. Right. Stories are powerful. Here's the power of story. When you tell your story, other people find themselves in your story. And it gives them the courage they're needing to continue in their journey. When Paul was on the road to Damascus, it's as though the Lord said to Paul, Paul, I'm about to give you a good story. Knocks him to the ground, blinds him, grills him, sends him to the nations, heals him. I mean, the whole story is just so dramatic. And when you follow Paul's ministry in the book of Acts, he is always telling his Damascus Road story over and over. Paul, why do you always tell that story? Answer, there's power in a good story. Paul's Damascus Road story had the kind of power on it that could help people who could not get a grip on the kingdom of God. It would give them something to wrap their fingers around and find their place in the kingdom of God. Lord, would you give in Lexington men and women who walk a journey and gain a story, a Damascus caliber story, that when they tell it, others will be able to wrap their fingers around something and find their destiny in the heart of God. Whenever Paul got in front of an especially tough crowd, he would pull out his Damascus Road story because of the power on that story. Okay, Lord, I get it. You're writing a story with my life. Can we get on with it? Or am I the only one that sometimes feels like, I don't even think there's a story going on anymore. <clears throat> I was raised in church back 
when I was a kid in church, they didn't have a, a thing for the kids. You just learned to sleep. <laughs> so, I mean, all my, you know, growing up, they'd say, uh, Bob, uh, tell us your story. And I'm like, well, I was raised in a good Christian home. I've loved Jesus all my life. I said, Lord, my story's boring. It was as though he said, we can change that. <laughs> 24 years ago, I'm, I was blindsided. Here it came, launched me in a journey, and now I'm profoundly aware that God is writing a story with my life. But here's what I've discovered. He rarely writes short stories. <laughs> He's too good an author for that. He's not into that, you know, flash in the pan, boom, bam, zip, it's over. No, 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 no. He, he says, I'm going to write a story with your life. I'm going to put some suspense into that thing. I'm going to write some intrigue into your story, some adventure. I'm even going to put some romance into your story. So by the time it's over, you come through lovesick for Jesus Christ. He's just that good of an author. So. I'd like to talk for a little while this morning about that portion of our story when it feels like nothing is happening. I'm going to talk about two people that illustrate some things that really help us, Jacob and Abraham. We're going to show a quick film, and that's it. First of all, Jacob. I wonder if you've ever asked the question that's on our screen. God takes Jacob and his little family of, from Canaan and puts them in Egypt for 430 years. Well, actually, the scholars tell us based on Galatians 3.17, the scholars say actually they were in Egypt itself for more like 200 years. So it's the same question. God, why did you put Jacob and his family in Egypt for 200 years? They were not exactly 200 happy years. I think the answer is found here. Back in those days, the number one killer of human population was war. And if God had left Jacob up in Canaan with his little family of 70, over the decades, their family would have been constantly bombarded with warfare. Their population base would have been continually eroded, and they would have never found the critical mass necessary as a nation to take the whole land. And so God's basically saying to Jacob, Jacob, let me do you a favor. Let me put you in captivity. And now, a captive in Egypt for over 200 years, and, you know, Jacob's little family in, in bondage, God places them behind the front lines of the Egyptian military. And for over 200 years, Egypt took all the hits and Jacob's family just kept growing. For 200 years, the family of Jacob did not suffer a single casualty to war. They just kept growing. They got so large as a nation that by the time they came out of Egypt, they actually rivaled the population of Egypt itself so large that they could 
enter their promised land, take their promised land, inhabit their promised land, and hold on to their promised land. God puts you into captivity to enlarge you. Shuts you down, puts you in confinement, God, I, I, I thought you were writing a story with my life. The Lord's gone. Actually, I am. This is a time to get large. This is a time to grow in faith, grow in love, grow in grace, grow in the knowledge of Christ, grow in intimacy, Grow in the word, grow in righteousness, grow in meekness and humility. Just say it to the person sitting next to you. Never waste a good prison sentence. If God shuts you down, turn your prison into an incubator. Is it possible that you can get so large in this prison that the prison can no longer hold you? Is it possible you could get so large in this incubator that by the time you come out of this season, you are large enough in the grace of God to enter your promises, take your promises, and inhabit your promises? Abraham. The verse on our screen is describing a 25-year period in Abraham's story during which nothing was happening. Abraham was promised a miracle baby when he was 75. He didn't get the miracle baby until he was 100. 25 years waiting for God to fulfill his promise. That's what this verse is pointing to, that 25-year wait. And the scripture says, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. And I just have one question. God, have you read the Bible? Because if anybody here has read the Bible, anybody here read Genesis? You've read the story of Abraham? You know that's not the truth. If anybody wavered at the promise of God, it was Abraham. Hello, the guy was a professional waverer. You look at his story. He is an up and down, wishy-washy roller coaster from the beginning might I say, to the very end. The guy mastered the art of wavering. And the Bible says he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. I'm like, are you and I reading off the same script? Abraham and his wife, they put their heads together. They're like, you know, it seems like God's having a hard time delivering on that promise. He probably would appreciate a little help on this end. And we end up with Ishmael. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. Give me a break. We've got the baby to prove it. How about that time in Abraham's story when he says to his wife, sweetheart, I want you to tell the man that you're my sister. Because if the man knows you're my wife, he'll kill me so he can have you. Babe, save my life. Tell the man you're my sister. <laughs> Abraham. 
Abraham pulled that stunt twice. And the Holy Spirit has the gall to say to us, he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. Holy Spirit testifies from the time he was 75 to the time he was 100, he was strengthened in faith. The Holy Spirit testifies from the time he got his promise until the time he got his breakthrough, he was strengthen in faith. The Holy Spirit testifies. Now, listen to it this way. The longer the answer was delayed, the stronger his faith got. That's right. What kind of faith believes God more the longer heaven is silent? supernatural Abraham kind of faith. Now, here's how I chart the verse. He was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God. He was a roller coaster the whole way, but when you look where he started and where he ended, he had more faith at a hundred than he had at 75, and God said, I call that not wavering. Because God's not looking at this. Here's how God does the math. He takes off all your lows, because when you're depressed, he's not. He takes off all your highs, because when you're having a spiritual moment, he's not that impressed. <laughs> and he's looking to see how will you walk with him through the years. I want you to hear it today. God does not measure your spiritual journey in days. Good day, bad day, whatever. God does not even measure your spiritual journey in weeks. Good week, bad week, he doesn't pay attention. He doesn't even measure your spiritual journey in months. Good, ma good month, bad month. It's not even a blip on his screen. Listen. God measures our spiritual journey in years. The question in the heart of God is not, are you having a good day or a bad day? The question in the heart of God is, where will you be this time next year? Where will you be, sir, in five years? Where will you be, my brother, in 10 years? Where will you be, my sister, in 15 years? I'll tell you where I'm gonna be in 15 years by the grace of God, growing in the word, growing in grace, growing in intimacy, growing in love, growing in the knowledge of Christ. I'm using the time to get large. Somebody says, well, Bob, the reason you're not healed yet is because you don't have enough faith. And I'm like, well, of course I don't have enough faith. Who ever had enough faith? But I've got more than I used to because I'm being strengthened in faith. But I don't have as much as I'm going to because I'm being strengthened in faith. I'm on a journey with God. He's writing a story with my life and I'm staying in the thing to the very end. And I'm probably the biggest roller coaster in the house today. You catch me at 9 a.m., I'm one thing. Catch me at 2 p.m., I'm something else. My emotions, because of this, yank me all over the place. And I don't even pay it any attention anymore. In fact, don't even ask me if I'm having a good day. I don't care. <laughs> if you want to ask 
ask me a question. Ask me this. Where will you be this time next year? I'll answer that question. I'll tell you where. I might be like this in the meantime, but this time next year, I'm going to be growing in faith, growing in love, growing in the grace of God, enlarged in good works, enlarged in righteousness and humility and holiness by the grace of God. I'm using the time to get large. And one reason I talk about this is because the enemy wants to use this against us. He's like, yeah, God was going to write a story with your life, but you're such a wishy-washy basket case. You have disqualified yourself from the story. I want you to hear it. It's not this that disqualifies you from the story. It's if you check out of this. Never let go your story. Lay hold of that for which Christ has laid hold of you. Press into every chapter. I think he wants to give you a Damascus caliber story, that kind of story that has power on it to change the lives of other people. Stay in the story and let him finish what he has started with your life. Your story is in the hands of the Alpha and Omega. He is good at this stuff, and he will finish your faith. My son has put together some films for me. You can see them on YouTube, the film you're about to catch. You can share it with your friends on YouTube. I think it'll bless you. Just saying, Lord, just let me quit. Let me resign and crawl into a hole 
somewhere and God will not let me resign. What do you do when you can't quit and you can't keep going? The elders of our church were gracious to me and they extended to me a six month sabbatical. I called the summer of 94, the summer from hell that was horrible because now they are paying me to figure this thing out, to work it out with God and to somehow come to some kind of resolution. And so I'm, I'm just, I'm a wreck. Our church had three services at the time and I would bring my family to the Saturday night service to get it over with so that I wouldn't have to go on Sunday. I remember this one weekend, we came to church Saturday, got up Sunday morning, got in my reading chair, got my Bible out, and I've got such a cloud of oppression over my mind, I can hardly breathe. And I'm desperate for a word from God, because back in that season, the only thing that would strengthen and help my soul would be a word from God. As Ephesians 1, 17 speaks about the spirit of wisdom and revelation, when the spirit of revelation rests on the word and something comes off the pages that is life-giving, that's my only source of sanity in this season. And so I'm in my reading chair, I've got my Bible, and I'm like, please, 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 I am desperate for a living word from Christ. in the spirit. Let's see if we can get the river of God to flow a little bit. Dust bowl. After about three hours of trying to get something moving in the spirit, I literally threw my Bible on the floor. I said, that is it. If I'm going to hurt this bad, me, 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 navel gazing, pity party, fetal position, self-centered, Myopic, my little world of pain. I hate this. If I'm gonna hurt this bad, my kids are having fun today. I'm taking them to a baseball game. Now you have to understand something about the way I was raised. I was raised in a good Christian home where you honor the Lord's Day. You don't go to baseball games on the Lord's Day. So I've never been to a baseball game in fact, I've never been to a baseball game at all, but I am in so much pain right now that I don't care about the rules. I grabbed my kids. I've got three kids, Joel, Katie, Michael. I grabbed a couple of neighborhood kids, threw them into my minivan. My wife didn't want to go with me, so it's just me and the five kids. Off we go to watch the Rochester Red Wings AAA ball team. But I'm like a first-timer. How do you get in? Where do you pay? Where are the bathrooms? But I'm trying to be cool. And so I'm like, come on, kids, here we go. And we finally find our way into the stadium. They got their hats, they got their baseball gloves, and I'm in an ornery mood. I'm like, everybody gets Coke. Everybody gets popcorn. Everybody gets a hot dog. And so my kids are sitting there in the stands. It's a mid-August day, summer of 94, 75 degrees, not a cloud in the sky, baseball in America. Katie is sitting next to me, and then the four boys, and I'm sitting there, and the cloud has not moved an inch. I am absolutely miserable. And I start having this conversation, I don't know if it's with God or myself, but I start having this inner conversation that starts like this. Do you even understand where I'm at? They are paying me to come after you right now. I am coming after you with everything I know, everything I've got, and I cannot shake this cloud of oppression over my mind. God, this thing is not working for me. Am I losing my mind? Do you even understand where 
I must have done something to get you really angry at me because you're taking away from me everything I've ever prepared for, everything I've ever functioned in, everything I've ever been called to, everything I've ever been fruitful in. You're taking it all away from me. What did I do to get you this angry? I swear, when you're in that kind of a tender place emotionally, you have a demon parked on your shoulder because I've got this megaphone in my ear that is just yelling at me, abandoned, forsaken, it's over, wake up and smell the coffee, God's finished with you, you're a has-been. I mean, I'm hearing all this stuff in my ear, and every symptom in my body is telling me that's the truth. But did I hear another voice? No, 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 no. This is the voice. This is the voice of reason. This voice is so loud. But did I hear another voice whispering, I am with you. I am for you. I've chosen you. It's not over. This is going somewhere. And I'm sitting in the ball game, torn between the two voices, desperately wanting to believe that I am hearing the still, small voice of the Spirit. But this other voice is so loud, so compelling, so real. And as I'm sitting in the ball game, this crazy idea goes through my brain and I am like, no, I am not asking God if I can catch a baseball as a sign that this is his still small voice, that he loves me, that he's with me that he's chosen me. I am not asking God for a baseball because, like I said, I was raised too well for that. My parents put it into me from my youth. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You do not do that kind of stuff with God. And so I am not asking God for a baseball. Stop it. And then it kind of changed a little bit and became like this. I wonder if God would let me catch a baseball as a sign that I am hearing his still small voice. He is with me. He's closer than ever. He loves me. He's for me. And I'm just like, this is a bad way to think. And I'm trying to shut the stupid thing off. And I cannot shut this idea off in my head. And my analytical side kicks in and I start calculating my chances. I've never been in a game like this before. What are my chances of catching a baseball? So I'm, you know, pi r squared on the field. I'm, I'm, I'm counting how many people are in the stands. I'm, I'm counting how many balls are being caught. They're not catching baseballs. And besides that, we're under this overhang. There's a set of bleachers above us. A ball couldn't even get here if it wanted to. Stop this. Three quarters of the way through the game, this guy hits a fly ball with one motion. Hundreds of people rise to their feet. Baseball gloves come out of nowhere. Seen so many baseball gloves in all my life. Everybody's on their feet, reaching for the sky, and I'm on my feet with the rest of the fools. Here comes the ball, obviously not coming my direction. It comes like this it's a cross beam at the base of the overhang, careens off it at this bizarre angle, and comes down straight at me. It hit me in my hands, bounced off my chest, and landed in my daughter Katie's lap. There was an old codger sitting in front of me. He turns around and he says to me, I've been coming to this field every week for 25 years. I have never caught a baseball. Katie goes, 
I got a baseball. I can't talk to her because of this, but I'm looking at her, I'm thinking, that ain't your baseball. That's my baseball. I took that ball and I just held it in my hand and I sat in the stands. He gave me a baseball. I don't know if you have room in your theology for this, but I'm telling you, God gave me a baseball on a Sunday afternoon. And I don't know if my interpretation is right. I'm just telling you what it meant to me. I'm not finished with you. It's not over. Continue to abide in my love. Live in my word. Give me your heart, and I will finish the story. I've started.